Well, it's finally here. After more than 30 high elo highlights and 1 million mastery points, I think it's about time. So you want to play Lee like me? Well, there's a lot that goes into playing Lee like me. And this isn't the guide you think it's going to be. On the 29th, Lee will have been out for 5 years. Outplays, highlights, and namesakes are funneled down players' throats. And many still have no clue how to play him. Some of the supposed gods of Lee Sin are still struggling to climb out of silver. I'm here to offer you everything I know about how to play the blind monk. But let's make this clear. I'm not going to teach you how to play Lee. I'm going to teach you how to jungle. You're a jungler first and a Lee main second. In order to develop as players, we have to address solo queue mentality. If you want to climb the ranks, you're going to have to go in with the correct attitude. This is true for players of all elo, from rank 1 to the last. In solo queue, a player is not allowed to have expectations. The system's not trying to cheat you. When League decides what players you play with, it simply takes into account two variables, your win rate and players around your MMR. In short, the game's job is to give you a 50% win rate. This means that players with less than 50% win rate will be matched easier games, and players above will be matched harder ones. This is why you'll often find yourself going on win streaks and lose streaks. Because the game simply gives you players around your skill level, if you want to climb, you need to convince yourself that you're better than all 9 players you play with. In theory, if you believe you belong in a higher elo, you need to accept that the players you play with are the rank they are because that's where they belong. Sometimes it can be difficult to be the driving force that wins games. Convincing yourself you're better than everyone else you're playing with requires quite an egotistical mindset, which can be difficult for players suffering from esteem or anxiety issues. This topic also addresses the concept of anger towards solo queue. Anger is a sign of weakness. The thing is, in solo queue, you're not allowed to have expectations of the players you play with. You have no justification in expecting them to play a certain way. If you think they're bad, that's because they're meant to be. Telling them they are simply shifts the blame away from your ability to carry and your development as a player. If you want to climb, you need to understand that the players you're playing with will not carry you. They are at that elo because that's where they belong. If you want to climb, you're going to have to do the heavy lifting yourself. So how do we improve as players? If you break League down into its subparts, there exist two things you can improve at in League of Legends. Your mechanical ability and your decision making. Mechanical abilities are your ability to play a certain hero to its fullest capability. You can practice this by simply playing the champion more. Decision making is everything else that decides your gameplay and can be shared among your hero pool. Our decision making needs to be improved when we lose games and when we die. Every death in League of Legends occurs for the same reason because you underestimated your opponent in some way. That tower dive that left your lane opponent on one health, the invade that went all wrong, the counter gank at mid lane, the only reason you ever die in League of Legends is because you underestimated your opponent's capability. The player who wins League of Legends the most is the player who understands their limitations the most. You can build a more accurate estimation by improving your mechanical ability and your decision making. And that's really just as easy as looking at your black and white screen and thinking where did I go wrong. Runes are simple. Flat AD, flat armor, 6 CDR glyphs, and 3 MR glyphs. Mastery is a little more complicated. For most players between bronze to diamond, I suggest 12 18 0. For ferocity, I prefer attack speed for the clear. As for tier 2, you have a bit of variety, but I suggest grabbing feast over the other two. Double edged sword is nice, but I dislike having to take bonus damage. As for exposed weakness, I still prefer the survivability of feast over the small bonus damage dealt by expose. Plus, it only deals bonus damage for abilities. Vampirism, especially when paired with a W max, can give you a very meaningful difference in sustain when clearing. Finally, take Bounty Hunter over Oppressor. I know Lee and most other heroes have a slow, but the likelihood of you getting at least 3 unique kills is fairly high early on Lee. It also helps you scaling into late game fairly substantially. As for cunning, Savagery makes a large difference on your first clear. The movement speed from Wanderer is nice when moving between lanes, but most top meta heroes such as Runic Echo, Elise, Nidalee, and Udyr will be much faster than you anyways, so there's little benefit in taking Wanderer. I prefer Runic Affinity in the second tier because having buffs for longer is the most meaningful difference any of those alternatives can truly make. The rest are all logical. I know on the topic of runes and masteries, you'll often see competitive and top rated players vouch for Strength of the Ages instead. So let's explain what's going on here. When most people think of Lee Sin, they think of his versatility. Lee Sin as a hero can simply operate as necessary. He can do anything. He can objective control, vision control, gank, counter gank, assassinate, peel, tank. He can be anything his team needs him to be, which is why he can be played as all five roles, including ADC. 
This is why it's important to be a jungler first and a Lee main second. It doesn't matter how well you can play the monk if you don't understand how to transition from early to late, and what your team requires from you. You can do it all, but you need to know when and why. In the same breath, it's Lee's versatility that will always result in a bit of identity failure for the monk. Because you can operate in so many ways, players will simply steer to play him in the most effective way they can. Right now we look at junglers who are at the top, and almost all of them can duel and outgank the monk. Right now the duelist we all perceive Lee to be is the weakest he's ever been. On an even playing field, he can't go toe to toe with most champs. So what are players left to do? Well, you can still play Lee Sin, and you can still duel people, but you have to understand how. Right now most players are favoring Strength of the Ages over Thunderlords because Lee Sin has to generate a level advantage before he can truly find effectiveness. Heroes like Nidalee and Elise have their ganking power spikes available at level 3, because they have all their abilities. Lee Sin, however, needs to wait till 6 before having Dragon's Rage, which gives you the ability to duel, gank, and counter gank. This is really important. Lee Sin's are running Strength of the Ages because it benefits the most from the playstyle that Lee has to take on to be effective, which is essentially just farming it out till 6. At this point, you don't need Thunderlords to be effective. Keep in mind, I did recommend Thunderlords Decree for most all players. This is because solo queue is the domain where people make mistakes. This is the reason off-meta picks can succeed in solo queue. As long as you can outperform the enemy, it doesn't matter how badly you've gimped yourself with your hero choice. You can still identify those mistakes and capitalize on them. In theory, a hero becomes the meta champ by being the one who can best capitalize on these mistakes. I recommend Thunderlords because you don't yet understand how many mistakes occur in solo queue. Think about it. What does it take for a gank to be successful? Someone has to be out of position. That's all there is to it. It doesn't matter how pushed up they are, it doesn't matter whether you had to tower dive. If you show up and get a kill, the player you just killed was out of position. Players make many mistakes in solo queue, and positioning is probably the easiest to capitalize on. There's a reason most top lead jungles average as low as 25 CS a game. This follows the idea that a good jungler doesn't jungle. If lanes are out of position, it's in your best interest to shut them down instead of farming. Before we talk about gank paths, we have to talk about jungle clear. Lee's clear doesn't have to be unhealthy. To show you how healthy it can be without wasting any time, I'm going to show you a leashless, full clear without any potions. This is the starting clear I suggest for anyone who wants to play Lee jungle. This will get you level 4 in under 4 minutes, and enough gold to buy a jungle item and a ping. This start is excellent. It guarantees you a quick high level, a solid jungle item, wards if you're going trackers, the option for potions if you started out healing pots, and a pink for lane control. Jungle clearing is simple, but can take practice. The beauty of me doing this leashless clear is that you can practice it. You can join a custom right now and practice this till you nail it. Jungle clear is simply starting bot side, regardless of which side you're on. You do this because of a better leash. I know some junglers will like to give bot lane the bot camp, but you should only do this if you're in very high elo. Start the bot camp and simply work your way up through each camp in order. Because I'm doing this clear from red side, I'm going to explain it for that side, but you can copy the order in reverse for blue. Smite Gromp and move on to the blue buff. Kill the golem before moving on to the sentries. For wolves, kill the young before the mother. For raptors, kill the small ones before taking on the crimson. Move to red, smite the elder lizard and kill the smaller ones. After that, we can move on to Krugs. There's an interesting trick you can do with Krugs that will save you a lot of health. By pulling the camp slightly out of its cubby hole, you can actually kite the smaller Krug around the larger. If you do this right, you can kill the larger Krug without taking a single hit from the smaller one. Practice this until you can do it right. Staying as healthy as you can in the jungle is incredibly important. If you can nail jungle clearing, you can improve your jungling capability dramatically. So where do we go from here? I mentioned earlier that a good jungler doesn't jungle, and most Lee's average is as little as 25 CS per game. Well here's where your decision making as a jungler comes in. You need to decide where to go. The decision you make here can be the most important one you make this game. You're simply looking for a lane that's out of position. A lane is gankable if a player is too far up lane, if your laner has a strong gank receival, or if a lane can be counter ganked. Simply look at each lane and figure out where you're needed. Sometimes you'll have many options, and sometimes you'll have none. Solo queue is a game of risk versus reward. If you want to climb ranks, you'll need to win more than 50% of your games. That's it. It doesn't matter how many more games you win than you lose. As long as you're over 50%, you'll climb eventually. 
You need to play in a manner that will consistently win more games than it will lose. So in the statement of risk versus reward, you need to make decisions which yield high reward for relatively low risk. If you believe you can arrive at a lane and expect to kill, then do it. If you're unsure, maybe sit back and farm. If you know where the jungler is, maybe you'll look to get some deep wards out with your tractor knife. Vision is hard to come by in the early game, and a deep ward early is invaluable. How to identify whether you can successfully gank a lane is something you'll get better at. But the truth is, if most junglers are averaging as little CS as they do, then more often than not, a lane is indeed gankable. Which is why I suggest you try to manage a very gank-heavy playstyle until you develop a stronger understanding of what it takes to gank a lane. Once you get better, you'll be able to decide your game plan at loading screen alone before the game even starts. Granted, you should realistically only hold these expectations to more advanced ELO techniques, but if you improve, you'll be able to benefit from some time spent thinking before the game even starts. Let's take this example. Here are our matchups. Lucian Alster in bot lane against Jana Ez. Alster's grabbed Ignite in hopes of having kill pressure up on bot lane. However, Alster has a notoriously poor level 1. We can expect Jana Ez to push in level 1 to prevent a level 2 or 3 all in from Lucian Alster. Theoretically, kill pressure will go over to Lucian Alster by about level 5 or 6. In the jungle, we have Nocturne against Lee Sin. Lee has fairly strong dueling against Nocturne early on, but the CC from his fear will likely mean that he will look to fight 2v2 or 3v3 skirmishes early on. Nocturne has a near guaranteed kill condition once he hits 6, so we can likely expect him to power farm till he's 6. Because Nocturne's power spike is around the same time bot lane hits theirs, we can conclude Nocturne will probably choose to ulti bot the moment he's 6. That means what we're looking to do is either counter gank to match his, or blow bot lane summoners before then if possible. If we can get Flash out of at least Alley, it will give Jana Ezreal a fighting chance against Paranoia. In mid lane we have Azir vs Zed. Zed wins this matchup at all levels quite easily. Azir can hold off Zed's kill pressure early by pushing mid lane. Because Azir will be pushed in mid, we may choose to hover around the lane early to prevent a likely Nocturne gank. Lastly we have Quinn against Fiora in the top lane. Quinn decimates this matchup. The correct move to make is to assume Quinn will win this matchup, and simply trust in her to take care of her own lane. Now granted, she may proceed to die over and over, but if she's losing that matchup, jungle help wouldn't have made a difference. A jungler aims to help laners help themselves. If a lane can't help themselves, then we don't help them. In theory, the only proper way Fiora can gain a lead is through a TP gank bot. So before the game even begins, we have a battle plan. Hover mid to prevent Zed kill pressure early, maintain a level lead in case we need to meet a gank bot lane at 6, and try to blow bot lane summoners. If we can prevent bot lane from getting a kill, we'll prevent Nocturne and Fiora from getting a lead. So now we've got our early game out of the way. The most interesting talk I can give this guide is how Lee Sin transitions from early to late game. We know Lee Sin can do anything your team needs, but when should you do what? There's a lot more that goes into certain decisions than it looks like. I mean, Insect created his namesake from one move alone. One big turnaround play. But the truth is, the ability to make plays on Lee Sin is not an extent of your mechanical capability of the champion. It might be blind luck for some, but to operate consistently well in a manner that wins games, we have to think before we act. At the moment, beyond Lee Sin's level 6 power spike of having Dragon's Rage, the early game is quite unfavorable for the monk. Most meta jungles will outperform Lee Sin early, forcing Lee to stall till mid game. A strong takeaway from Lee's kit is his ability to choose his own fights. This means that Lee Sin can start fights, and more importantly, end them. He has the ability to chase someone down, and he has the ability to stall and hide. Lee has much to his kit which allows him to respond to almost every single game's win condition. A game's win condition is simply a realistic scenario that has to play out for a game to be won. These can be objective controlled. For example, a team that obtains Baron or 5 Dragons is likely to win. They can also be teamfight oriented. Let's say if we can keep the ADC alive in a teamfight, we'll win. This means you have to peel. If you can make a catch happen onto the enemy carry, we'll win, meaning you have to engage, assassinate, or pick. The truth is, for an insect to go well, a lot has to go right. Very often an insect isn't successful simply because you performed it fast enough. It's successful because you attempted one under the right circumstances. A lot of times, enemies won't allow for these circumstances to happen, so you're usually left to peel. So what do you do when you have to engage onto the enemy carry but you can't? Well, you've seen me do this a bunch. Let's explain how this can help. The Wrecking Ball Kick is simply the movement of kicking one hero into another. In teamfights, this can be incredibly helpful. The success of a Wrecking Ball is not just in the damage it does to the units it hits. The neat trick is that you can often Dragon's Rage the front line into the back. Doing so eliminates the front line and creates just a back line. 
This allows for your team to move forward onto the carries without worrying about getting past the front line. Of course, this technique takes a lot of practice. So what do you need to play Lee effectively? Well, there's a few things you should know about. I didn't intend this to be a guide on Lee's mechanics, so I'll only mention what I believe are the essentials. War dashing is something we've all practiced, and you might not feel you're fast enough. I play on about 60 MS and can war dash at a speed I deem quick enough. Now, copying someone else's hotkeys aren't something I recommend, but here's what works for me. What you need is a binding for quick cast item and quick cast trinket. These are under the item category in the bindings menu. These will help you drop your wards in one click instead of two. As for your safeguard, there's a binding called quick plus self cast. You can use this to bind for your safeguard. This allows you to shield yourself without targeting yourself. I also recommend having regular safeguard quick casted. You can use one to shield yourself and the other for dashing. Most mice have two side buttons. My recommendation to anyone chasing smoother Lee mechanics are to bind one mouse button to quick cast ward, the other to self plus quick cast safeguard, and the W on your keyboard to quick cast safeguard. Operating this way allows you to do a two hand motion to ward dashing using your dominant hand to drop the ward, and your other to dash. Probably the only other hotkey I'd recommend is to have your attack ground bound to something. Attack ground is important. You can use it when face checking bushes to immediately attack wards you find, or heroes you find. More importantly, it assists Lee's energy control phenomenally. If you have energy sustain issues, you're likely not auto attacking enough. Lee's passive is flurry, which generates energy on attacks. If you're ever lost in a teamfight and just need energy to dash out, hit the attack ground hotkey anywhere and you'll have what you need. There's two tricks I think are worth noting too. There's one that if you've been following me at all you've already seen already, and that's the Dragon Insect. The Dragon Insect is essentially using the Dragon's Buffet mechanic to gain extra distance. The Dragon buffets all units around it directly away from its model on aggro. By using your Sonic Wave on the Dragon and immediately casting Resonating Strike, you can right click in the direction you'd like to be pushed forward. Another is the Dragon's Rage buffering interaction. Playing against the Twisted Fate demonstrates this well. Attempting an insect against the Twisted Fate is usually a fool's errand. Anyone who tries this knows what happens. You get gold carded mid-Q, and you die. But surprisingly enough, if you're quick enough on the draw, you can get a Dragon's Rage off during the stun effect by queuing up the kick mid-air. Before we go, let's lastly talk about item builds. What you see on the right are probably the only item purchases you'll be making on the Monk. Your early game should see your completion of a pair of basic boots and your warrior jungle item. I vouch for Tracker's Knife over Stalker's or Skirmisher's for two reasons. Early game vision control is hard to come by, so having the wards accessible as early as you finish your Tracker's Knife is invaluable. Second, without Trackers you'll likely be shoehorned into making an early purchase of Sightstone. An item which due to recent nerfs is less significant of a purchase for Lee, and since you're making it early, you'll forego 800 gold that could have contributed towards your next item. However, you can make an argument for Stalkers if lane ganks are plentiful, or Skirmishers if dueling is likely. You'll probably try to make do with just your Trink Awards if this is the case though. As for mid-game, an early lead can benefit greatly from a cheap offensive item. The best item for this job is a Hex Drinker. Its shield scales with your level so you can sit on it all game and upgrade it at the end if you have to finish the 6th item. With offensive items, you have to understand that I'm not a big fan of large expensive purchases used simply towards damage. Building damage on Lee Sin does one thing. It widens your assassination window. Lee Sin is a hero who tends to dash in and out of combat, taking hits for the team while he engages or peels. If you build damage, you'll be too fragile to maintain sustained combat. As a result, you'll simply be trying to assassinate. As the game goes on, however, your ability to assassinate begins to wane, and you need to build more damage to compensate. This is why I don't like spending too much on damage for Lee Sin. You have to have long-term thinking towards this. If the game goes on for too long and you have all these damage items, you're eventually going to lose your assassination window altogether when you hit a damage wall, meaning you can't get any stronger. At this point you'll have all this damage and probably all the team's kills, but no way to meaningfully impact the game. This is why Hex Drinker is ideal. It favors resistances over damage while still giving you a strong advantage early. If you've got a lead but the enemy team doesn't have any magic damage, you may vouch for Phage into Black Cleaver instead. You should usually only build Phage if you're planning on upgrading it fairly early. Sitting on the Phage alone isn't all that great. As for defensive items, Deadman's Plate has seen a recent nerf, but is still strong due to the nerf to Swiftness Boots. Because we don't have to mindlessly rush Swiftness Boots anymore, many junglers can reconsider upgrading their boots early. By building Deadman's before upgraded boots, it gets you the movement speed of tier 2, but the defensive stats of a full item early. Pair that with an on-hit damaging slow, and you've got a solid core defensive item. Randowins is on par with Deadman's cost and stats, so you may vouch for it instead against early crits such as Gangplank and Yasuo. The slow field also follows the aforementioned reasoning. Banshees and Thornmail are logical purchases. 
There are certain situations where you can benefit from a Tiamat, Gage, or Mobi boots. Tiamat can replace your early offensive item if you're convinced you have a lead, you can snowball early, and are facing a team of squishy heroes who will remain squishy all game. Don't bother upgrading it though. Gage pairs excellently with a Maw against certain assassin comps. It's not the best for Lee, so really only build this in very specific circumstances. The bonus AD it gives is to your base, but Lee's AD scaling is based on bonus. So the only damage benefit you get from Gage is from your auto attacks. Moby Boots can be purchased early if you feel as though you'll be rolling all game. Just don't try to team fight with them. As for more standard boot purchases, Merc and Tabby are both very solid. Merc if they have a lot of CC or magic damage, and Tabby if they have a lot of AD. Well that's it for this guide. Make sure you hit me up with what you'd like me to cover next in the comments below. Thanks for watching.